Okay, all right, let's rock this. All right, so HR Gill, meeting today, Saturday, once a while. Let's see, who's, who's supposed to be leading this? Okay, today is me. All right, so let's go into this. Um, let's see. Projects. Projects, projects, projects. How are we doing on the projects? Mm hmm? Okay. And do we, we, we agreed on Utara, right? Probably not. Probably not. If he hasn't been here for the second time. So, can we continue without Gabby? Okay. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask was, did the OE people ever claim their um, certificate? Oh, okay. All right. Fantastic. Okay. That's good. That's good. All right. So let's take a look at uh, Mark Levy. Mark Levy. Mark is... Let's see if he's gotten back to me yet. So, let's see. How do you feel about like how HR is going right now? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we're also not getting very many people through the pipeline either, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Why don't we do this? Let's see where our candidates are dropping off. Okay, well, let's let's see what Mark Levy has to say. So Mark, I think, is coming back from Europe. And what sort of questions would you like to ask him? What sort of, like, do you think is the missing piece from us getting, let's say, hundreds of hires? Yeah, or what can actually help us get to the next level? What's the uh, what's like the the missing piece that we're we're, we're lacking right now? Like KPIs. What kind of? Hey, what I know is that the the, the chapter sent in a requisition. Usually, the squad lead or whoever's the manager, they send in a requisition. So they say, "Hey, look, I need a person like this, right?" And then the HR person sits down with them, and then they get the job description and sort of like the key uh, attributes uh, in. Generally speaking, the HRS process is just to filter out by like, on non-fit, non-company fit for the first interviews. So it's just like kind of screening away people who are uh, just just not not really. They wouldn't even be a fit in the company. But after that screening, typically it goes over to the hiring manager, whoever actually wants to onboard that person. So then that person then interviews and uh, you know further further selects the uh, the candidate. So in the aspect of what we're doing here is mostly just to screen out people who would not fit in the company at all. Not necessarily who would not fit into, let's say, the role or, or whatnot. So uh, that, in terms of benchmarks, is, is what I've seen. Um, what, what more do you mean by benchmarks? Like, what else do you mean by benchmarks? Mm -hmm. 
No. Okay. Okay, got it. So nobody's actually put together a a requirement list. Have you seen that? Nobody's actually put together a list, a pretty detailed list of what she's looking for uh, in terms of in terms of what you just mentioned. So she wrote it right here. Uh, it's over here. So she's looking for somebody. She's looking for somebody who's a fast learner, has a lot of capacity, sociable, articulate, thought process driven, action biased, patient, well tuned player, right? And she's proposing that we have tests for presentation, understanding complexity, problem solving, time and time management, and lead generation and grit. Looking for a part. Sure, sure. I think this is on her personal um, uh, journal, right? So she shared it with me to, to, to have that. But what I'll do is I'll go over here and let's see. Let's, uh, let's put this over here. Let's put this on kind of like external visual description. Uh, this is a bit of entire thing. Okay, so put it here. We'll call it MB job requisition. Okay, let's go through the question asking process then. Um, do you feel confident that you know what the parameters of a good host are? Yeah, like a host. If 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 you when you go about like let's say interviewing hosts, do you feel like the benchmarks for that are pretty clear? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I do understand that. Actually, I'm facing the same uh, uncertainties as well. For 
Yeah, you can turn off this video. This video is distracting. So, in, in the case of let's say finance, um, you really gotta, <clears throat> I think you really gotta leverage what the finance team knows. They know essentially what it is. Okay, the best. Okay. What I think. Without the fact. What what we're looking for essentially is just simply this, right? Um, on the first screening, all I expect is that somebody on our side just checks to see if this person's a good fit. So, do they have a growth mindset? Are they, um, do they have a strong bias to action? And do they, uh, do they seek guidance and mentorship? I believe that if they have these three aspects, then, then they're pretty good material to begin with. In fact, it's actually more important that they have this than experience. Did you ever get a chance to interview that HR person from uh, Movenpick? Okay. Oh, you did. Very, very good. Okay, fantastic. All right, fan fantastic. Uh, maybe we can upload that later. But what did you think of that person? Yeah. <laughs> right. Childish, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's trivial. Okay. See, that's what I mean. Um, so in terms of evaluating weight on experience versus, let's say, growth mindset, bias to action, and, uh, and seeking correct guidance and mentorship, self-learner. I, I think I got it down into three. So do they have a growth mindset? Do they have a bias to action? Or are they a self-learner? If they have this three, then they're always a fit, no matter what. Like, they will learn how to do anything that happens. Then they'll be, they'll be able to keep up when the new version of a workflow or an SLA shows up. So, I think those are crucial. If they don't have that, no matter how much experience they have, it can actually be worse. So, like that lady, if we had hired her, I think she would have been just very difficult to manage. She would have been like, well, this is the way I used to do things. And this worked in a big hotel. It should work here, too. And so without at least, let's say, those three things, uh, it's very, very difficult to determine if a person will have success here. So that's all we're screening for, back up to the big picture. So we're really screening for at this level. Um, would this person be able to thrive here? Would they be able to succeed here? And if, whether that's any role, right? Whether that's, let's say, finance or engineering or, or any role that we don't even know yet, um, if, if, if it's a no on that, then it's a no overall. Now, once again, there are some special cases. Like I know engineers and fi you know, the, uh, finance, they might be special cases. Uh, there might be special urgencies where we might not have the luxury to, to get a complete hire, like, like you know, completely right. But generally, in terms of what HR's role is and the benchmark of, of the first interview, is just a screen for that. Do they, should we, you're like a college admission officer, right? So they're essentially applying for college. And yes, do they meet the basic criteria for admission to college? Once they get into college, of course, they have a major, they have a professor, they have everything else. But you're deciding whether or not just they do they belong in this college, so to speak. So that, that's pretty much it. Um, in terms of finance, in terms of, I would ask the same kind of question. I'd be like, hey, look, what's the difference between like the way you began doing your finance career and today? What are some things that you have seen or have changed personally in your journey? So these things reveal about growth mindset. Then find some other, you can ask the common questions like about bias to action. When you have uncertainty on, let's say, an accounting record, what do you do? Or let's say you've, you've, you've detected an error and your boss is sitting next to you and you're presenting a part of a client. How do you, how do you present this mistake, right? These are all, I think, really good questions to show what the underlying thought framework is of a, of a person. And I think it's up to us to actually determine what those key questions are to really just reveal, does this person have growth mindset? Does this person have bias to action? Do they seek guidance and mentorship? So that, that is, uh, I think that's the same across everything. That's the same whether it's a role in finance or, or elsewise. Uh, once, go ahead.
<laughs> Whenever you have doubt, pass them. If there's doubt, you got to pass it. If, if, if you have no doubt, then that's when you throw away a candidate. But if you have any doubt at all, send them down to the next uh, interviewer. And the reason for that is because if you're not sure and you dismiss the client, uh, dismiss the client, dismiss the candidate, then whatever your thought process was that made you reject the candidate will never be changed, right? You'll reject the next candidate and the next candidate and the next candidate too. And perhaps that thought process, let's say, is... Uh, is, is dismissing candidates that are actually pretty good. I'll give you an example. So you know how Rafik got here, right? So Rafik was kind of an out-of-the-box applicant. He just showed up. And I thought, hmm, okay, that was odd. Uh, you know, didn't, didn't even want to interview online. He said, I'll just be there. So he showed up. He said a bunch of stuff that seemed very hyperbole, like larger than life. And, and it all sounded very strange, and, and I, I was very dismissive. Uh, Wayana said, no, this guy is actually the real deal. He, he, he and I have worked together on some cases, and and, uh, and he's, he's, he's quite the thing. So I was like, oh, really? And then and then eventually we hired him, right? And uh, and that turned out to be, I think, a very successful hire. It turned out to be a very good decision. Um, if we didn't have Rafik, we probably wouldn't be here right now. So going back also to, there's a few other cases, like Nia and Vincent. I mean, Nia and Vincent aren't here anymore, but right off the top, they weren't exactly... <laughs> uh, normal people, even Vincent in his capacity as a back-end programmer, uh, a bit odd, right? Like not, not exactly the most sociable person, but that doesn't matter, I think, in, in certain cases. It does, it does kind of balance out. So whether a person speaks strange or they have like, I think from finance that can be forgiven, like let's say risky, right? Risky at first was very, 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 very shy. Right? Yeah, it took him a long time to, to sort of find his voice and find, you know that 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 flow. But once he found it, it's actually quite, quite, quite clear, right? He's got like a clear idea. His mind, thought process is strong, and I think I think he's uh, he's doing a lot of good work. So, in terms of let's say if you're not sure, pass, pass it to me, pass it to whoever, and uh, and get that. What we're looking for is this. Like I said, remember the uh, false negative, right? So. When you, when you reject somebody, it's essentially giving them a negative. But sometimes it's a false negative. How are you going to know it's a false negative? Pass it. Pass it to the next person. I'm not sure. I pass everything that I'm not sure to you, right? So we're essentially checking each other's work for false negatives. Um, you tend to have a very strict filter. You have a different filter than me. So this is actually good because essentially if a person goes through both filters, then I would assume that, okay, this person is truly a fit. If a person passes one filter but doesn't pass the second filter, then don't know. Right? So um, yeah, I would say uh, uh, I think I think we're losing a lot of candidates in the new uh, cycle. We're we're also seeing to have a traffic jam in the waiting for uh, candidates to follow up or waiting guests, uh, for candidates to get back to us. Let's have a discussion about that uh, in just a bit, right? So, okay, we've, we've taken a long journey around uh, this initiative, as we always do. We always have these wandering discussions. So um, now is about a good time to reach back out to Mark. He is back in San Francisco now, August. He's working at Allbirds. And, uh, and yeah, so this, this can be actually pretty interesting. So, um, right, uh, I'll follow up with Mark, and let's just leave this here for Old Business to follow up next week, okay? All right. So we already started the trial on LinkedIn, so this part is done. Uh, we can take a little of that. Uh, okay. And, uh, oh wait, maybe maybe I'll nominate you to be secretary, yeah? So just a participation, yeah. Okay, so your second question is, should we process overqualified candidates? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, process anybody 
if, if the CEO of Google wants to apply for work at Cookie Vista, you say yes. Yeah. <laughs> you say, absolutely. How how do you think you can help us, right? Like I think that's 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 your lucky day. <laughs> that's 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 let's say the whale has shown up or the master has, has arrived to the door. So all we have to do is recognize that that is an extreme opportunity. Uh, we'll make that work. If the CEO of Google decides to apply for work here, then we got to say yes. Um, on top of that, on top of that, let me show you something else. Uh, this one's pretty interesting. So do you know Elite Havens? No? Ah, okay. All right. Elite Havens. Elite Havens. Elite Havens is just the biggest name in luxury villa rentals in like Bali, Phuket, you know, Southeast Asia. So they have been doing this for quite a, quite a, quite a while. You know, the, catering to the the one thousand to five thousand dollar a night um, villa rental uh, category. So they they're like our grandfather era. They started in nineteen ninety nine here in Bali. And they had like, actually we're bigger than them now. Um, at one point I think they had about 50 villas, but they're all very high-end villas. They're all very like like super luxury. So Elite Havens, their uh, their founder doesn't work there anymore. So I reached out to him actually. His name is Ian, and uh, I'll show you my conversation with Ian. It's pretty funny. So I talked to Ian and I said, Hey, look, this is pretty weird. But it's, it's also part of, I think, the whole HR experience of seeking guidance, seeking mentorship, self-learner. Uh, sometimes these really excellent people don't necessarily apply. You gotta, you gotta find them. So this guy was pretty funny. Uh, I reached out to him. He's, the, he's essentially the, uh, uh, the founder of Elite Agents. So I asked him, hey, look, I think uh, we should meet for coffee or lunch. Uh, I read about your business. I'm doing the same. And I think you're the best person I can speak with. What do you think about that? So then he said, I live in Phuket, uh, what are you doing, right? I told him, this is what we're doing, we're, we're kind of like, uh, you know, like a mini elite May events, can we set up a phone call? And then he says, I'm busy, uh, I, I'm gonna go to Europe, I said, great, this is what I wanna talk about, this is my WhatsApp. And then he says, okay, I'm, I'm flying out to Canada soon, I said, I can understand. He says, good luck. And then all of a sudden one day, he sends me this picture, right? He sent me a picture of a model on his Instagram, right? Right, but this lady's standing at his villa, and he's very proud of that. So he's like, okay, now, now the conversation's gone a completely different way. It's from, like, I'm too busy to talk to you, to, hey, look, let's be buddies, and let me share, like, pictures of, uh, pictures of, of girls in bikinis with you. And then, essentially, uh, I go, great, that's great. You're in the lifestyle business. He corrects me, and he says, I'm in the villa business. On and on and on and on and on. And then all of a sudden, this is pretty weird, uh, at 1 a.m. a few days ago, he says, he's chatting with me on LinkedIn, I'm here playing Mortal Kombat with uh, Alvin and Yvonne, and then he chats me up and says, all right, you got 10 minutes, you want to talk? At 1.30, at 1.30, and I say, yes, what's your number? He says, check your WhatsApp, and then we talk, right? And then uh, essentially, Essentially, this, this guy is probably in a position where we can work quite a lot of people because he's done it before. Uh, all right, so anyways, Ian, then, um, so we chat some more. He's sending me pictures of his villas. He's, he's, I feel like he's like trying to sell to me. He sent me this bait picture again, and then he's sending me more pictures of like his villas, and he's budding up. It's really weird, right? Like he goes from being kind of cold and prickly and like leave me alone uh, to being quite open. And so, um, so we're networking now, we're talking and finding out a lot of the problems we're facing are actually problems everybody faces in the villa rental business. So he said accounting was a big headache. Nobody could figure out how to do it right. It was very, very complex for accounting for villa owners. He's saying that essentially all the bundle payments go into the Philippines and then they get unbundled and they get sent out to the owners. The owners would look at the big lump sum of money and they'd be like, what, what, what's in this sum, right? What is this for? And uh, so that, that was a similar problem that we had faced too as well. And so anyways, why are we talking about this? Uh, I think outreach is actually something that you in HR can actually explore and get much better at. That would, I, that would be what I would consider process excellence. So 
In terms of, you understand the process already a little bit, right? You sort of like, you know, interviewing, screening clients and everything. But if you reach out, like the way you reached out to me at the conference, if you reach out to, let's say, somebody who really, really knows their HR, you know, somebody who's, who's maybe hiring at Gojek or somebody who's doing whatever. Hell, maybe your next job will be your HR at Gojek, right? But, like, if you if you reach out to these people, you'll find out that most times they're actually quite open to sharing their knowledge. Um, just say, hey, look, my name's Ara. I'm working at a startup. I'm looking to get some tips on hiring. Would you be available for a call one day, right? And half the time they say yes. <laughs> they go, oh, yeah, sure, okay, I, you know, because uh, you're essentially agreeing to be their follower. You're agreeing to like listen to their advice. You're gonna buy their book. You're gonna subscribe to their blog. You're gonna follow them on Instagram. And who doesn't want to have a fan? So from that perspective, it's actually quite uh, a, a fast way to jump over these hurdles. Otherwise, you've got to figure out yourself what, what the things are. Make sense? What do you think about that? There you go. I mean, doing that can actually accelerate your career by probably 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. When you start networking and finding, let's say, the right people to talk to, you, you elevate your thought process. You elevate your... I, I've noticed a lot of people who do this professionally, or let's say they have experience, they think completely differently than, let's say, the people around you right now. So they have they have their insights on, on and, and probably completely different from me. They might actually know way more about, like, what it is about detecting emotional intelligence, understanding how to all voice and it correctly, correct procedures, all this stuff, right? So I think in HR, what I find pretty fun about this is that you have access to it. You, you should be actually sort of not just contained within the world of applicants, but you should also be seeking, let's say, people who, who you really respect in terms of like what their selection capability is, or what their you you really admire their teams, and you're like, hey, how did you how did you build this team together? And so that that is, uh, I think that's the journey of over five quality, and that brings us back to Mrs. Mobin thing. I mean, a person like that, I couldn't actually see how that person could hire a quality team, and I couldn't see that as well how a hotel with a five star brand would select somebody like that to, to select their team. So I'm thinking, what the hell is going on in hotels right now, right? So that actually tells me that this entire industry is doomed. If, if, if all it takes is that caliber of person to be controlling the entire structure, then there is no control on who is going to come into the hotel and who's going to serve in the hotel. It's all run by processes, not by people. Okay, so that is, uh, that's my thoughts of overcall. Uh, candidates. Get as many as you can. <laughs> and if they don't want to work here, maybe invite them over for coffee, visit the base, do whatever, and just get 10 minutes of their time to speak, because that would, itself would be would be pretty valuable. Okay, great. So we got the job requisition there. Um, Secretary, let's go ahead and delete that, and we will go on to the next site. Okay, uh, we need set programs for six-day on-site trials for each chapter. I think we have a roadmap for this now, yes? Okay, all right, so this is already in development. Um, let's see, should we put the roadmap up here in the uh, SLAs? Do they go up in the SLAs? Oh, is it the workflow? It's higher than the workflow, though. Yeah, it's higher. Yeah, I think it should be in the SLA because the workflow is, the roadmap sort of dictates where the next workflow will be. So it, it, it has to like have a, a sort of a hierarchy there. Uh, okay, so let's see, we've got this, we got values, we got workflow, and then uh, roadmap. Okay, all right, so maybe we do this, right? Road. 
Yeah, there we go. So now we have version control. Okay, well, let's talk about this really quickly. Do you think anything needs to be modified for the online guest support roadmap or after Kano? Kano. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. I saw that. Yeah, he was doing a lot of check-ins and, and what's up on what's up. Okay. All right. Okay. Can't deal with the high intensity thing. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Um. So okay, that that's pretty revealing. Uh, all right. So let's keep that. That, that seems like be something that works. Okay. Let's, uh, since this is already in the SLA, so we can then, uh, I guess, delete it or uh, do this. We need a trial for HR now, so that's something I need to work on this weekend now, because uh, we have new HR people coming in. Okay, next one, on-site guest support. Okay, that, that's the same, right? So this falls into essentially the same bucket. We can delete that. And then one month notice on the onboarding SLA. Okay, uh, have we put that in yet? Okay, all right, cool. All right, done. Okay, any change on the MOU partnership contract should be changed and edited by a law firm. Right. Er, okay, good question. Go over to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. is actually, let's say, how would I say it? Um, when you sign up for an Airbnb account, um, you just go, yes, accept the terms of services, and you're on, right? When you sign up for any internet product, you just go, yes, accept the terms of services, and you're on. Um, that's the direction we need to head to, right? Uh, lawyers, I believe, everything that's an offline sort of case, I think we need a lawyer who's actually more specialized on internet um, type deals. Because 
Well, let's say, for example, Google changes their terms and services, which they do all the time. There's a clause in there that says, when we decide to change anything on the terms and services, you have opted into these changes too as well. Right? So I think that then allows for, let's say, that kind of flexibility and keeps it more legal. If we, okay, I'm thinking about deal flow, right? If you have the deal flow go through and then each new MOU needs to go through an approval process and then whatever, then, then there's a contract process that it really slows down every deal that we take and it slows down the overall uh, capacity for growth. I think at this point in JoJo, we can just keep the MOUs as they are, it's fine. Uh, but once again, we then have the same problem as we had before. Joke just starts evolving at a much slower pace than, than, than Volley. The purpose of the MOU is really not to actually have it be anything besides an understanding between us and the client. That's why it's an MOU. That's why it's not actually a binding contract. Um, why do we not do binding contracts? The time it takes to do a binding contract is often prohibitive and also very, how would I say, uh, 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 it doesn't actually, it's, in my opinion, uh, let's say for example right now, right? Uh, Kura Kura, they want to pull out and they want to, let's say, ditch a few of the uh, future check-ins, uh, future guests coming. All right, so I can point to a binding contract and say, hey, look, in this contract, you said that you want to do that. And he would go, so? And then I would go, okay, I'll take you to court. Go, go, go right ahead, right? And so, it, you know, it, it, is that worth it? Does that actually, is it worth it for me as a CEO or whatever to go to court, fight this guy for three weeks or whatever, just to get him to allow my, hard to say, right? Um, so essentially, this is mostly as an understanding on a piece of paper between us and the uh, the other side, right? Like the MOs you use, we sign with UGA, with UI, all these things. They're not binding contracts for a reason. They're more ceremony than they are commitment. An MOU can just be at the end of the day. Well, you know, I decided not to do that. It was just kind of like an idea, but but it's not binding, right? Um, it is interesting, maybe in the future, if we should actually sign binding contracts to 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 secure that. And I'd be open to that idea. But it does slow down deal flow quite a bit. If you think about ultimately where we want to be, we want to be a company that provides services just by clicking, click here, and your services start running, right? So just like Google, just like Facebook, just like all these other companies. I think the evolution in terms of law is we need to talk to somebody who actually understands how internet law works. How do you create online uh, agreements? And in the future, it has to be that way too. What if the owner isn't here? So then we have to shuttle a piece of paper back and forward in 2019. That, that doesn't seem right. So um, lawyers are, are, in my opinion, always going to find a way to keep themselves paid. This is what they do. And so this is, this is essentially, I think, it's one part business for them in terms of extending the subscription. And one part of it is, yes, it has to be legally valid. Um, OK, here's my call. I think in Joe to just keep it the way it is. We're essentially on a certain version of the MOU that is, I think, going to carry us forward for a while. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Okay, um, let's let's do this. So we have to appoint a law firm to do this. Um, I don't think this will work at all. Uh, mainly because er if every change we put in, we put in changes after every, uh, we're, in, we're in sort of a high evolution phase, right? So before we said, okay, we wanted to change the owner usage from seven days to not seven days anymore, right? And then we tried that out and nobody said yes to that, right? So we're going to lose all our partnerships if we don't change that MOU. Now, okay, we send it to a lawyer, the lawyer is on holiday and then we wait and then the client's on holiday and then the deal never goes through. So the only solution I think to this problem is to say, how does a company like, like Google, how does a company like Facebook, how do they deal with that? They get all this legal access in whatever country they operate in, and it's just you click accept and it's done, right? So what is it about that that makes that work? And what is it that we're doing that still requires paper and ink and stamps and everything to get things done? So. That's, that's, that's what I'm thinking about in terms of that. Um, 
once we have that, then I think we have the same playing field as the internet companies, and now we can do, you know, uh, we can evolve, we can innovate, and not get trapped in a, a sort of a, a legal morass. Okay, anyhow, um, let's see. So my answer right now for Joja is, okay, in Joja I think, yes, just keep the MOU the way it is. If you want to change it, um, go through the lawyer. But here in Bali, we're, we need to be able to keep the innovation flow going. Uh, do you remember the Spotify video with the fast release cycle? So we're already slowing down in market building dangerously, dangerously, right? We're adding all these SLAs and all these things and everything. And it's beginning to grind the entire market building into like non-existence. It's, it's like everybody's sort of, if we, if we keep on adding more friction, I think, to the market building evolution, then we start getting into a cycle where we don't launch, nobody has any confidence of bringing new properties and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to correct that, that process as well. And, and you can see Nomi's pretty frustrated with, you know, she's, she's trying to get this thing to jump to as well. Okay, so on this one, I think we can table this discussion, and I think I'd like to evolve the discussion to ask the question, how does Google do it? How does Facebook do it? And if we can have the same service as that, then I think we're on the right boat. And I think we can actually find out how they do it by just looking at their legal team and asking them, hey, look, hey, how did you do this for Google? Maybe you can teach us how to do it. Outreach. Yeah, hell yeah, you can Google them. You don't just go like on LinkedIn. You have my LinkedIn. I'm connected to like I think everybody in Indonesia. So you just, you just go over here for people who look for Google, right? People who work for Google. So you look for people, and then work on the Google Legal Council, right? Uh, for Indonesia, and then you can ask them, hey, look, what do you do for, let's say, Google, Google. No. Okay. Let's see. Uh, people who work at Google. Uh, ah. Okay. So people who work at Google. And then located in Indonesia. There you go. Right. And then you apply. <coughs> Let's see, Indonesia, up here. Machine learning, machine learning founder, conceal the zero marketing, country head. Uh, ah, here's somebody who would know, right? Here's the country head of Google. So they probably would know something about who is, uh, how to set up a legal document, right? Henke. Oh, Henke's too popular. He can't actually have any, uh, uh, wow, okay, this guy's, wow, Cornell, Duke, Nanya, wow, that's pretty complex. Okay, now he's the uh, country head of Google, working on the next billion users. Let's see, country manager, oh wow, all the heads of each country. Um, digital consumer strategy, senior account manager, Android, okay, all right, cool. So, uh, I guess just dig around until you find somebody, or maybe even just Google it, right? So Google Legal Council uh, Indonesia, right? Ah, there you go. There's that person, Regional Council Southeast Asia. And let's connect with them. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to send out, so I'm connected two degrees away. We both know Dimas. Dimas, Dimas, Dimas. Okay, all right, cool. Send now. Done. Okay. All right, and that's how we connect. And we see, I, I think I think we always have to escape the scope of the traditional world. The scope of the traditional world is, yes, the, the Patnuki world, the sort of the paper and pen world. So if we want to like elevate ourselves to how is law done in the internet world, how are these things regulated, they're not the same. In fact, they're far more powerful. If you think of a company like um, WhatsApp, WhatsApp has what? I think a few hundred million users in Indonesia, maybe 200 million users in Indonesia. And do they have any contracts that they sign with any of these users, right? Um, do they have any legal obligations to any of these users? They're one of the largest companies that have like the most clients of anything and yet they don't have a single legal contract with anybody or I don't know maybe it's it's in 
It's in if you ever read the terms and conditions when you sign up for WhatsApp. Yet they know everything about what time you're meeting your mom, what time you're meeting your boyfriend, what time like all these things are happening in your personal, personal, personal life, right? Who else are you dating? So this is this is kind of odd, right? If you think about it, like in the internet world, the legal situation works far differently than in the offline world. We ultimately aspire to be an internet company. We are Indonesia based right now, but in the future, I think it should be. Let's say you click a button, you sign up for Book of Vista services, and a Book of Vista photographer shows up at your door. And then a Book of Vista host shows up wherever you are to help with the operations, get everything right. Then the host disappears and works on other things. So ultimately, we should be mostly a uh, almost like a nomadic company in that regard. Okay, cool. All right, let's. Uh, good discussion though. Good, interesting stuff to speak about. So um, let's pivot here, right? Can we pivot and say, uh, how do we find out more info about how the law? works on the internet. Okay. Oh, internet. Okay. Internet. But in the meantime, the MOU and Jojo I think is fine, right? There's, there's no more changes that need to, so we can just keep on using that one. Uh, if there is any changes, yeah, sure. Three million a pop also isn't cheap, right? It, it's, it gets a little bit, that gets a little bit, uh, if we just want to modify whatever, because I heard also each modification costs like a million rupees or something. Like at first the document was pretty boilerplate and then we wanted to modify it. And that's what Pat No, hell no. No, no, Pat Nupi said like essentially at first it was really cheap and then we made no modifications. Yeah, that's that's where lawyers get you, right? I mean, that's, that's, it's like, yeah, you want to change it, then I charge you for it. You want to change it, I charge you for it. So uh, they act as essentially a activity driven culture. All right. So we have this now. We have uh, Patmuki's uh, proposal that's over here. Okay. And, uh, let's see. Okay. So here it is. Booyah! Okay. And we can put this here. I'm pretty much in agreement with it. I think Patmuki's proposal is actually quite good. Uh, it's very, very ambitious. Uh, and this is what essentially I put up on the top. So it's essentially an SLA agreement, right? Um, we need to have essentially this. So I need, I need, I need essentially a timetable uh, from Patna B to say when are these going to get done. And I think that's a great SLA. Once we have a timetable, then we have essentially a uh, prize for each milestone. It's like picking up coins in the video game. And then I think that's a pretty fair way to set up a, a, a new, new system for payment. What do you think of this? Exactly. All right. Okay, great. So that, yeah, if we, if we don't have a time to it, it's just an idea. If we have a time to it, then it becomes more concrete and yeah, better planned and such. Okay, all right. So we have that. That's moving along. Thank you. And uh, uh, I think Pat Nuki is starting from next month. will be essentially on a university relation. Uh, consultation salary, and uh, we'll make some adjustments to um, his compensation structure too as well. Okay, so this part is essentially uh, done, I guess. Can we move it over to old business now? Okay. All right, and the benefits of EQ. All right, I thought this is just something to share with you. Um, this is related to uh, emotional intelligence, right? So I thought this is actually kind of interesting because this is a good way of understanding fit, right? Um, you can see most of our candidates don't necessarily have technical or, or whatever issues. Their, their main issues are related to, like these things, right? They have difficulty asserting themselves, they don't step on toes, so they just accumulate and let bad things happen, and then all of a sudden one day they get so frustrated they quit, right? Uh, they have limited vocabulary. I thought this kind of targets the heart of some of the problems that we see in hiring and some of the issues that we have in the employee experience. So when we don't have a full emotional vocabulary, uh, if we don't have people who can assert themselves, then um, then yeah, that's, that's essentially these things. 
Uh, like me in Bahasa, I have limited emotional vocabulary in Bahasa Indonesia. I cannot express. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a natural language or expression. So so read this, right? So if you don't have enough ways of expressing, let's say the only expression you have, this is my problem in Bahasa Indonesia. I can only express joy in Bahasa Indonesia. I cannot express disappointment. Um, you know, I can't express really anything besides joy. <laughs> because every encounter I've had was in a joy, so hey, how's it going? Everything's all happy, right? So if I need to be serious with somebody, I don't have the emotional vocabulary to come up with that. Um, because unlabeled emotions go, they're misunderstood, which leads to irrational choices and counterproductive actions. And so once, once uh, I think we have, let's say, a full range of emotional vocabulary, then you can be much, much more specific about how you feel, what is the exact issue, and what is the concern, and, and that. And it comes across as much more expressive than being like, oh, this person's moody. I'm not sure why they're moody. And it's usually they're moody because they don't quite have the words to express what's, what's really bothering them. All right, what about this one? What do you think about this one? Uh, passionately, like with passion, with almost like kind of a, yeah. So I would, you're, you're on headphones right now, right? So I saw, what I saw yesterday happen between Cynthia and Dominic was that, actually. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, but it was mostly on Dominic's part where I saw this was actually being being done. So she made the assumption that Cynthia didn't want to help and she wasn't reciprocating. And then also, I think it was like she wasn't clearly understanding the, the problems in, in uh, she wasn't really, she was making the assumption that it would be really hard to actually handle the Jojo air support. But I think what was missed there was the sense that she, Dominic didn't see how Cynthia is already overloaded, right? So it's like asking a person who's it's like, well, the way I saw it is, it's like, uh, we need to donate blood to our friend who is losing blood, right? So the blood flow needs to go from us to them. It's like, I'll give you blood if you promise to uh, look after my pets. But like, I'm in the hospital. I'm, 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 I'm clearly unwell, right? How can I have any more bandwidth to look after your pets? So that, I think, is a, is a case of making something as quickly. And then defending it. Like, why, why are you, why are you, um, so what should happen, I think, in a case is better understanding. It's like, okay, not just I respect your decision for saying no, but I understand your decision for saying no, and, I, and I'm and i assuming that you're saying no because of this, but I can see that it's probably not because of that. And I think that's a form of emotional control, emotional intelligence that is and it's quite important, as you can see, right? Because if you don't have that, then you have all these breakdowns. Of course, it's, it's, it feels unfair. It's like, I do for you, but you don't do for me, right? It's like this sort of, ah, Arinto! Arinto, thank you for showing up. Hey, we got two o'clock. Uh, Arinto, can I do this? Can I get back, can we start your interview and 15 minutes from now? I'm still in a sync up with uh, um, uh, my HR team. Uh, leave now, but please come back at 2.15, yeah? Okay, all right, thank you very much. Appreciate the uh, patience and understanding. Okay, great. Okay, so, oh, we're, we're going over time. Um, I think in this particular case, it was a tick for tack. So I think Dominic expected, okay, hey, look, uh, I do for you, you do for me, right? Fair? But it's not that way. It's, it's not essentially a symmetrical uh, situation. It's like, we're overloaded here. We need some help. We don't have the bandwidth to help you. Um, so that, I think, requires some, it, it requires some maturity. <laughs> Maybe to, to understand that part. So so that's that's why I say. What's your evaluation on that? Mm -hmm.
I don't. I don't think that was necessarily the. Uh, I, I think this is. I thought that interaction was highly immature. To be really honest, um, I think. I think it was highly immature. Uh, yeah. I, I, and, and and that I think was the sign of, of the person that you were you know, previously spoken about. And I never saw that until until that moment actually. So I think in in, in this particular case we're dealing with teenage angst. Um, you know the, the type of sort of. Sort of that thing, and it is emotional control. I think it is emotional development, emotional maturity. Um, the good thing about Dominic, I think, is that she feels ownership over her marketplace, and that's excellent. We want a squad lead that does have that that sense of ownership of, of they value their work and they value their responsibilities. But I think this is actually a good article to go to to think about like fit, right? So people who are easily offended, people who get mistaken, they, they you know. These things are, these things I think are counterproductive, and they're actually uh, quite toxic if we allow it to accumulate because it, it just breaks apart too much. What Cynthia did, I think, requires actually a recognition. I think that's that's precisely. Hello there. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Um, you must be, you must be early. <laughs> what what time what time is your interview? One p.m. Okay, one p.m. Jakarta time. Okay. Can I have you step back in in half an hour? At, at uh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually still on a call right now. Okay. All right. Sure. No worries. No worries. All good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I wonder how that happened actually. Let me see. Let's see how that happened. Uh, I had this guy the other day. I'm, I'm terrible at making my interviews, but it's like the world is also terrible at making appointments too, I feel like. It's like there's this non-commitment on both sides. Okay. Oh, Arinto's early by two hours. <laughs> He's supposed to show up at three, and Rugo is supposed to show up at... Oh, fuck. Okay, that's why. All right. So I see. Uh, Arinto, he's probably just dipping inside and checking out if uh, you can see this. Okay, Rugo. Okay, um, that's that. Okay, let me, let me jump into... I'm supposed to have another discussion with you about your contract, actually, as well, but that won't be recorded. So, so we'll we'll pick that up. Uh, let's see. Do you think this will be helpful for you as a resource to understand, let's say, culture fit? Because I think these things are red flags, right? Essentially, if a person, yeah, has has bad maturity or they have these these sort of um, uh, things. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, these are very specific to entrepreneurial type activities, and, uh, and that, that's that. Oh, right, to get to something, we need actually more people to do what Cynthia did. Right? I thought that was actually very courageous. I thought that was actually very, very uh, uh, correct, and it's very logical, and she should feel no uh, stress or uncertainty about expressing that. Uh, in that particular case, I saw that there was, there was a lot of anxiety, there was a lot of, of um, of stress when she expressed that, but I think I think we need to feel comfortable about saying, "I'm overloaded. I can't do anything more." Right? The world needs to have lower expectations of me today, because if I keep on taking this, then we we have the cases of let's say where we have the Chris, right? So this was a case where somebody never said no. This is a case where the 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 expectation bar kept on getting pushed up and up and up, and eventually all the services, you know, ran flat. And that's the natural outcome of anything where we oversubscribe. We say yes to this, yes to this, yes to everything, because this is very exciting. Uh, Cynthia had a personal talk with me about, like, yeah, she's so excited to be here. There's so many things to learn. She wants to do this. She wants to do this. She wants to do that. Yeah, she has this, all this other stuff to do. And my, my vision for her was we would recruit somebody new to help her with that so she could spend a little bit more time, yes, in digital marketing and, and copywriting and all these things. But currently, and she can't even keep what's on her plate uh, done, then she needs to declare that. You're the only person who knows you have a bad way. 
And so by doing that, that's actually a very responsible thing to do. That's a very clear thing to do. I think it's up to Dominic then to actually respect that, okay, this person has declared that they cannot accept, and they've declared their reason clearly, and we cannot expect other people to, to, to do that. So, so yeah, um, Mm, yeah, that's that's the emotional um, equation part. It, it makes everyone just feel a little bit uncomfortable about like, okay, if you're going to explode like that, then then there's far less trust uh, on the next interaction. Okay, so uh, that is that. Um, oops, I'm good. Uh, it was kind of, we got half an hour now. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the recording. Uh, I guess we got about 15 minutes until the next person comes in. But let me show you what I got. <laughs>